Tonight, a conversation with Prime Minister Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe about the progress and the problems in turning his African revolution into a new African nation. Good evening from United Nations headquarters in New York. Earlier today, the UN formally admitted the new African state of Zimbabwe as its 153rd member. Former British colony of Rhodesia became independent last April after years of guerrilla warfare ended in elections for black majority rule. The winner of those elections, now Prime Minister Robert Mugabe, was present here at the United Nations today. Mr. Mugabe will see President Carter on Wednesday to discuss increased aid for his regime, which came into being with the support of the Carter administration. Mugabe's emergence has raised hopes of a new era of racial tolerance and democracy in Africa, now that a century of European colonialism is formally over. Tonight, the problem still facing Robert Mugabe in realizing that hope. Jim? Robin, it's been four months now since Robert Mugabe took over the government of Zimbabwe. Some expected miracles. Zimbabwe overnight would become an economic and social paradise for the seven million blacks who had suffered under white minority rule. Others predicted disaster, physically for the 220,000 whites in the country, economically and governmentally for the country as a whole. There were still others who saw it in political terms. Mugabe, a Marxist, would turn his nation into a hardline communist state. Thus far, all predictions have been wrong. The four-month result has been a mixture of progress and problems, and most important for a nation torn by war for over 12 years, peace. The problems? Internal political tensions with Joshua Nkomo, Mugabe's old guerrilla ally, which is making it difficult to set up an integrated viable army. White flight at a rate of 1,500 a month, a situation exacerbated by the recent anti-government statements by the white former army commander, Peter Walls, and by the arrest of a Mugabe cabinet minister, Edgar, T Edgar Tukeri, on charges of murdering a white farmer. Robert Mugabe is with Robin in New York. Robin? Prime Minister, let's start with uh, the last thing that Jim mentioned, a story that has been in the news recently, the arrest of uh, Edgar Tukeri on the charges of murder murdering a, um, a white uh, farmer. That case is being seen here, at least, as an ultimate test of the principles you say the new Zimbabwe will embody. Do you see the case that way? No, certainly I don't. I don't think uh, it's uh, any more of a challenge than any other case that, uh, um, of the same nature that the police have handled. They will handle this case in, uh, in the same way. And I don't see any reason why it should... Um, uh, differ from the other cases. Obviously, a minister is involved, um, but uh, a minister is also subject to the law, like anybody else, and it is up to the courts to prove whether the minister is guilty or uh, not guilty. And given even that he is, was one of your associates during the long guerrilla struggle, that uh, he's the general secretary of your political party, that he has a strong political following in the country, do you have confidence that he can receive a trial like any other person? Yes, certainly. And uh, he's willing to subject himself to a trial like anybody else. There and is no question of our um, having it otherwise. Um, we feel that if the police have made out a case against any one of us, um, it is only right and proper, fair to the particular person um, charged, and also fair to the people that uh, the minister subject himself to a trial. Given that the victim of the crime, whether Mr. Takeri turns out to be guilty of it or not, uh, given that the victim was a white farmer, does that not add a special dimension in the politics of Zimbabwe today? Some people would want to see it, of course, um, um, as a different case or a, a case falling in a different category um, because, one, a minister is involved, and secondly, uh, a white man um, is involved as the victim. But uh, as far as we are concerned, um, 
the situation is that there is a charge which has been uh, made and um, there is a victim uh, who suffered death and that victim could have been a black man actually part of the charge is attempted murder um, which um, is uh, centers around the fact that uh, three other people uh, were um, also going to be victims but these are three blacks and so the case is not just exclusively uh, centered on um, the one aspect of a dead white man uh, it is also centered on three others who it is said would have become uh, uh, similar victims and as far as we are concerned uh, whether uh, a white man dies or a black man dies in circumstances that lend themselves to a charge, uh, the charge must be the same. Have you taken any special pains yourself to say to the justice authorities in this case, make sure that justice is done and is seen to be done because it is specially important that it is seen to be done? Or? I haven't said so in respect of other charges and naturally I won't say so in respect of this charge. But uh, I have said it in, uh, um, uh, in general that the law must take its course and that uh, uh, n the case must, be, must come to court without any let or hindrance by anybody. The other dimension of Mr. Takeri is, of course, that he is one of those of your government who has spoken out for a rather more rapid pace of radical change socially and, uh, and economically, whereas you have chosen what's described as a more moderate and slower course of change. Do you have the political strength to continue at your own pace? I don't know uh, Edgar Tekere to have made any proposals about any radical changes different from those which uh, we are undertaking at the moment. Whatever changes we are um, ha having to make are changes that fall within the programs that are agreed by our central committee as a whole and not just changes out of my own mind. And then they translate themselves into programs which um, the cabinet uh, must implement. This is how we operate. There's no question of Edgar de Kere being more radical than any uh, other minister uh, on these issues. None whatsoever, and I don't know of any proposal uh, of his um, which uh, can be said to be any more radical than uh, the, the proposals of other ministers. But you wouldn't deny that you have chosen a, a fairly moderate and slowly paced uh, course of change. No, we haven't done that. Um, when you say I have chosen, Your again, um, you, you are not ascribing the change or the pace to me as a person. But it's my government, you see, which has uh, embarked on a course uh, which requires that um, we take into account the uh, priorities uh, which um, uh, need our attention, uh, first and foremost. And uh, as, f as we see things, what we need, first and foremost, is the consolidation of our independence. The forces that fought each other yesterday must now uh, look um, at themselves as allies and work to consolidate peace and independence. Then secondly, there are those areas which are most urgent, where attention is required immediately such as the res uh, rep uh, dis uh, resettlement of our displaced persons and providing them with more land, which we are doing, getting schools back into function, uh, building more schools, uh, repairing those which were damaged, more hospitals, repairing more uh, those which were damaged, and uh, extending the services in that um, way. This is what we are doing, and uh, it's, it's being done quite fast. I don't see how anybody uh, could have done it otherwise. First, we must have peace. And only in the atmosphere of peace can we embark on any program uh, to transform the country. Do the masses who were your followers and voters in the election think that you were doing it fast enough? Yes, there are no complaints, really. None. The com only complaints I'm getting are from journalists and reports. You see, abroad, back home, people are not complaining about a lack of progress. In fact, they're very happy that government has proceeded in the manner in which it has done. You see, Already, education is free up to the primary school. Already, 
the health service is free uh, for the majority of the people, those of them who do not earn uh, more than $150 a month. And um, already land is being allocated to people. There is peace in uh, the, um, the area as a whole, in spite of the small incidents that remain uh, to be um, taken care of. And there is advancement in the public service. We have now, for the first time, at the head of um, uh, departments of government, Africans as secretaries. This never happened before. And the army is being integrated as fast as can be. Well, thank you. Jim? Mr. Prime Minister, another case that's been in the news uh, recently involves General Walls. He resigned, as, uh, as you know, as head of the army, and he had some bad things to say about you, saying that your uh, electoral victory was brought about by intimidation, among other things. I understand it now that you would like for General Walls to leave Zimbabwe. Is that right, sir? What I've said is that uh, uh, the statement he made uh, betrayed his true feelings, and that uh, if, in fact, that's what the nature of uh, man, General Walls, is, uh, then he hasn't got a place in our society. Uh, in other words, he should find a home elsewhere. Will you help him find a home? In other words, will yes, you urge Yes, yes, as quickly as possible. I see. Where is he now? I saw a report today that he was. He had gone to South Africa and was now back in Zimbabwe. Is that correct? He's back in Zimbabwe now? I think so, yes. Have you taken steps now to get him out of the country? No, but uh, it's uh, absolutely necessary that uh, um, he be assisted to uh, uh, get out and find a home elsewhere. I see. What were you, uh, what was his job? Uh, he was put in charge of the army on a transition basis for a year, is that right? To try to integrate the guerrilla forces of yours and uh, Joshua and Como's plus the existing army, is that what he was to do? Yes, that's, that's the, the main task uh, with which I charged him. But he was not to work alone, he was to work um, alongside uh, the Sanla commander, uh, the Zipra commander, the commander of the former Rhodesian um, army, and uh, the Air Force commander. And this is the uh, pattern uh, which we had established for purposes of bringing about uh, a quick integration of the army. But the army, of course, that had to be integrated was uh, Zanla, the Zanu uh, army, Zipra, the uh, Zapo army, and uh, the former Rhodesian army. Mm -hmm. Is that, that's not going very well, is it? The it's going well now. Mm -hmm. I think the main uh, hurdle at the beginning was um, lack of instructors to uh, uh, undertake the retraining program. But we have had, um, uh, we, have, we now have these instructors. We have had to train them ourselves. And uh, they're doing very good work. And the battalion is being turned out mm -hmm. uh, every fortnight. I see. That's not bad. Uh, on the General Walls case, did he, do you think he has much of a following among the whites in, uh, whatever, in Zimbabwe? Whatever the situation is, uh, he is an enemy of the country. Whether he has a following or doesn't have it, I don't think he has a place in our community. I see. The figure that I've read here again, as you say, uh, reports from outside journalists, but the figure I read today was that since you took office, some 5,000 whites have left the country. Is that, is that basically a right, is that a right figure? Well, that's the uh, statistical uh, figure which they give us, mm -hmm. that some 5,000 uh, or thereabout have left the country since uh, uh, our independence. Why have those people left, sir? I cannot say, but I think some of them just cannot accept the reality of an African government. They are racist in character, and uh, naturally to them or to uh, their type, we say good riddance. Uh, others are perhaps frightened, and we are sorry about those ones. We are sorry for them, really, because they needn't be frightened about us. Our policy is one of trying to accommodate everybody and to ensure that uh, all people uh, are treated equally uh, on a non-racial basis. Uh, those, that is the category of people we are sorry about. Mm -hmm. uh, others are probably uh, men, young men, in their 30s or 40s who um, are not quite sure whether they have uh, a guaranteed future in the country. Again, they have certain concerns and fears and would want to establish themselves as uh, quickly 
uh, or as early in their life as possible. Are you trying to give these people a guarantee about their future if they stay? Oh, we have tried to give them uh, all the assurances uh, possible, namely that uh, we are not going to discriminate against any person on uh, grounds of color or race, and, and that um, um, whites have a place um, and a role to play in our society. What role would that be? Well, a normal role, uh, mm -hmm. depending on the skills which uh, a person has. What about the, uh, the you, you're in your budget, uh, you have decided not to increase, uh, as I understand it, the tax rate in the upper income brackets. Uh, and this was interpreted here again by outside journalists as a gesture on your part to these very whites that, look, you're not out to get them, uh, you're not out to get them. Is that what you meant by that? Well, certainly, yes. We do not want to uh, make them feel that um, um, they are being discriminated against merely because they belong to the upper income group. And if we are to uh, levy um, onerous taxes on them, uh, it might force them out of the country or at least to reduce their earning um, capacity or the income that um, uh, remains after the deductions. And uh, they might feel that uh, this is unfair, it is discrimination, it is aimed at the whites, and that um, uh, government is therefore uh, not well disposed towards the whites. Yes, uh, thank you. Robin? Prime Minister, you're going to see President Carter on Wednesday, and you've already said publicly that you're going to ask for more aid from the United States. Why is the aid the United States has offered so far, $20 million this year, 20 to 25 to $30 million next year, not enough? Oh, obviously, it isn't enough if you take that and pit it against um, um, the sum which the British and the Americans were talking about at the time of the Anglo-American proposals, a billion dollars, you will realize that uh, a mere 25 million dollars uh, or even a hundred million dollars falls far short of the target of a billion dollars which we would require over a period uh, to uh, undertake effectively our development program. Have the, um, do you feel that Britain and the United States have reneged on the promises they were making when they wanted you all to sign the ceasefire agreement and to come into line? Mm, I think uh, other factors have intervened which um, uh, probably have uh, made it difficult for them to make uh, as much contribution as they would have made, say, 1978 or 1979, if we had got our independence then. Um, I also believe that um, perhaps the, um, the fact that uh, the original uh, promise was made between um, the Carter government here, Carter administration, and the Labour uh, government in Britain um, was responsible for the original figure and with the conservative government and now in Britain I think the tendency has been to uh, regard that earlier promise as unrealistic as one which uh, la the Labour uh, government w went into with the American administration but I would want to feel that um, um, even though the will to give uh, might exist. Perhaps the realities of the economic situations in the two countries and also the realities of uh, a political situation uh, in the United States might be uh, responsible for uh, the uh, reduced amounts. Um, Zimbabwe, the former Rhodesia, is one of the best endowed nations in Africa in terms of resources and has one of the most promising and partly developed economies. Why do you need more aid? What would you use it for? That also is another factor. People look at our infrastructure and say, well, in terms of uh, that economic infrastructure, we are uh, better developed and more advanced than uh, other economies in Africa. And uh, we prob probably are not... Uh, the worst beggars in Africa, there are others who are worse than ourselves. And uh, why should we be seen to be uh, 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 
uh, requesting for um, uh, concessionary uh, a uh, loans or for grants. Why should you? Uh, well, certainly that's that's that that's that's the question. Why should we? Our country has gone through a very um, protracted period of um, um, armed struggle and uh, of um, uh, sanctions imposed against the regime and um, there's been destruction uh, to part of the infrastructure. I was talking a while ago of schools that went into disrepair, schools that were closed, hospitals that uh, ceased to function and um, of um, the need therefore to uh, bring about uh, the reconstruction of our economy. We have to repair our economy and we need funds. Then there is the question of the population, nearly two and a half million to three million um, who were displaced because of the war. They have to be resettled. We need land. We need um, uh, money for uh, capital equipment. Uh, that those are some of the needs we feel, and there is no country which is in that um, most difficult position as, at present than ourselves. How much of that need do you hope will be filled by private investment uh, in your country, and how much by government aid? Well, see, private investment chooses where it wants to go. They, uh, uh, it chooses where uh, it benefits it most to invest. Uh, it could be in the mining sector, it could be in the uh, industrial sector, it could be in the agricultural sector. Um, and so you cannot force it to... Um, um, to build new schools. Yes, sorry. to build new schools, to, to go public as it were, uh, to take the same direction as government. And this is the reason why we want um, aid uh, from uh, well-disposed countries uh, which we can utilize for purposes of uh, uh, public schemes, which um, are not quite um, uh, the thing for private enterprise. Do you include the Soviet Union among well-disposed countries? Ah, the Soviet Union uh, uh, has not yet indicated to us uh, its um, uh, position regarding aid, but we have made our appeal to everybody, uh, including the Soviet Union, but uh, we hope as and when it establishes its mission, we shall talk about aid quite uh, uh, positively. Thank you. Jim? Thank you. Mr. Prime Minister, uh, why has the Soviet Union not established uh, an embassy yet in uh, Zimbabwe? Well, it's entirely up to them. We have invited uh, them to send a delegation uh, to discuss um, the question of their establishing a mission there. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they would want to, they, they're welcome to, uh, to uh, establish one. Well. But, of course, there are a number of things we would want to discuss with them, just as there were uh, things we had to discuss with other uh, governments before they established their missions. There are certain requirements uh, we expect of a government or a, st or a state which uh, establishes its mission in, uh, on our territory, and uh, we would naturally uh, also want to discuss um, those requirements with the Soviet Union. It sounds to me, sir, like there's something specifically that's bothering you about the Soviet Union. Is there? Uh, no, no, nothing extraordinary, mm -hmm. but uh, relations have got to be discussed before they are established, and oh. we haven't discussed them. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, the, well, as you may, may not know, the reports here in the United States have said that one of the reasons you've been reluctant to push ahead on uh, establishing a relationship with the Soviet Union is because the Soviet Union helped out uh, Mr. Nkomo during the guerrilla warfare uh, rather than your uh, side of the uh, patriotic front. Is there anything to that? No, that's not the, the reason, really. Um, there were quite a number of socialist countries which were more, uh, better disposed towards Zapo than ourselves. But uh, we have, upon discussing uh, the question of establishing relations with them, allowed them to uh, go ahead and um, have embassies. The Soviet Union hasn't done that. I see. Oh. What, uh, how would you characterize your relations right now with South Africa? 
the relations that exist between our country and South Africa are those we have inherited. They are mainly in the, um, the sphere of uh, um, um, the economic sphere. And um, they uh, have to do with our trade. They have to do with um, the uh, exportation of our goods, the use of the transport system that passes through South Africa. And these, naturally, we will retain uh, because it would be unrealistic and it would be suicidal for us to uh, try and uh, um, uh, stop them. So we can't savor uh, that type of relation with uh, South Africa. Then there are political and diplomatic relations. Well, we do not see uh, these um, emerging at all. Our belief is that um, South Africa um, must not be associated with politically and diplomatically because of its uh, apartheid philosophy that um, the international community has a duty to um, uh, pressurize on South Africa to bring about positive change uh, in its system so they can be established through democracy uh, in the territory. And in our small way, we would want to add to the pressures of the international community by denying South Africa uh, relations in the political and diplomatic fields. But you have to continue economic relations. Is that what you're yes, saying? Yes, economic sir? relations will continue, certainly. Would you hope to eventually sever those as well? Uh, I don't think you can sever completely relations with your neighbors, even if your neighbors are bad neighbors. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think you can reduce your dependence on a bad neighbor. Mr. Prime Minister, we just have a few seconds left. Everybody else has talked about what you've accomplished in, uh, in four months. Uh, in a word, how do you feel about what you're, what, how you have performed and how Zimbabwe has performed these, since you've been Prime Minister? I think uh, we have done very well indeed. We inherited a situation which had uh, all kinds of contradictions, some of them very antagonistic indeed. Uh, the whites were hostile to the blacks and the blacks hostile to the whites. And uh, within the blacks, they had uh, been developed a certain group of puppets who uh, worked against the interests of their own people. But uh, these groupings no, no longer exist. And uh, we have managed to instill into our population a sense of um, uh, oneness and common loyalty. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Good night, Robin.